So Jeremy Deem, where, oh, there he is, uh, <laughs> is going to present a brief history of thousands of years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so we're going to be all schooled up by the time he's done. Yeah. And then we'll move on to some other presentations. Hey, thanks, 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 Jeremy. Thanks, Yeah. Um, greetings and happy Indigenous Peoples Day. It's so awesome to be able to say that, right? Um, my name is Jeremy Deem. I'm Associate Professor of um, Outdoor Education and Social Sciences at the Summit Campus of Colorado Mountain College here in Breckenridge and Dillon, Colorado. Um, I, serve, I, uh, I proudly serve the campus um, in the History Department, um, instructing, facilitating American Indian history, Colorado history, American environmental history, and whatever else they want me to do. Um, and then I go backpacking and rafting for the other half of my job. Um, well, I'm, I'm honored and humbled um, to have been asked by Karn and the Friends of the Eagles Nest Wilderness today to uh, present to you. Um, it is, uh, it is um, quite humbling to, to be here, standing up here and um, attempting to offer you um, a history of a people Oh good, it worked. That's nice. And um, I, I would like to begin by um, offering you a very, a very quick rendition of how um, Colorado history or, or indigenous people's history usually starts. And then we're going to restart. It usually starts with something like this. You'll see this um, thing that has this, uh, it, it demonstrates the migration pattern out of the Omo Valley in Ethiopia, and, and then people migrated all over the world, and, and some people finally made their way across the Bering Land Bridge maybe 16,000 years ago, maybe 20, maybe 10, um, and then down and across the Americas. There's also a theory that they may have come up and did this coastal route theory and made it over here, or they may have even done this Pacific crossing and that's how it's told, and that's the only rendition of that history that I was told when I was in college. Um, and I took uh, American Indian history from Dr. Catherine Jellison at Ohio University in 1993. Um, they were chasing the megafauna, uh, these people that came across the Bering Land Bridge, and um, they unwittingly found themselves um, in North America. And then they killed off the megafauna. That's part of that story, too. Um, the newer rendition of that is, um, you know, there's, there are all these genetics. The Human G Genome Project was completed, as we all know, in 2003. And so uh, uh, fancy pants geneticists have looked at all the genes across the world and um, kind of matched people up scientifically to where, you know, they came from and w w w how we're all related, like, across the world. That's that. I'm going to start somewhere else. And this I have to go to here. And play you a short, play you a short clip of a Paiute lady, um, Glendora Homer, down in the Four Corners region. And she expresses a sentiment that most indigenous people express. That's not going to work, is it? Let's see. I'm going to have to just and give you my computer, see if you can listen to that. Yeah. 
the story. This land that we've lived Yay. All right. And so that's how that goes. And, uh, and, and that story's deep, and it's very difficult to portray the entirety of this sentiment in um, a 20-minute presentation. Um, but I challenge you to um, question your own beliefs in science and, and, and the importance of that versus the importance of um, a people and a, and a culture and, indeed, 550 cultures potentially across uh, North America. Um, and to take what uh, Mrs. Homer says to heart, that there, there, may be, there may be other explanations or other beliefs about how people came to be here. Um, but here's what we know for sure. And uh, my apologies, I don't, I don't love the word tribes. Um, I prefer nations. I didn't make these maps, nations or cultures, but um, it, uh, we, we can, well, this, this will kind of ground us throughout the rest of the presentation. We see um, really um, what we kind of know about um, places, um, artifacts, and, and human remains that we found um, across Colorado. And so here are kind of some of the um, very earliest ones, the sites that have been found. Um, and these are kind of interesting because these are actual human remains, uh, uh, the, the two oldest actually human uh, sites of human remains in Colorado, one called Hourglass Cave, um, remains of uh, um, a man in his 40s um, who was about 8,000 years old, and the Gordon Creek woman, someone about 9,500 years old. There's a lot more to the story of these folks um, in, in terms of uh, the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, if you've heard of that, NAGPRA and stuff. If you're interested, just look um, these up. But they're interesting because um, there's some of the act actual oldest human remains that have been found. But Karn asked me to relate not only Colorado's indigenous history, but to bring it to the history uh, specifically of Summit County too. And this lady's important. Her name is Dr. Elizabeth Morris, and she was an anthropologist at Colorado State University in the 1970s, um, which was a feat in itself for um, her to be um, a woman and to, and to gain that um, coveted position. Um, so my feeling is that she must have been really smart and really great at what she did. Um, she passed away, I don't know, five years ago, I think. Um, but she discovered and studied this place does anyone recognize that place? Anyone ever heard of that? <laughs> My house is right there. <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a site, many of you may not know this, you Summit County locals even, um, called the Porcupine Peak, Historic, Porcupine Peak Historic Site, and it's archaeological site. And it is on, I'm, I can't tell you exactly where it is. Um, I'm not allowed. <laughs> um, but it's named after the peak there in Keystone, um, the peak that you know splits between Montezuma Road and Highway 6 goes up there to Rappo Basin and Overleveled Pass, and this goes up to Peru Creek and on up to Montezuma. Um, but somewhere up here, <laughs> there is a site. Um, and uh, Dr. Morris from Colorado State University studied the site um, 1970, July 1977. Um, with a bunch of students from CSU, and they found artifacts here in Summit County at this site, and at another one in Ar Argentine Pass, on just this side of Argentine Pass up there, um, that are 6,000 before, 6, years before current era, what used to be known as BC, before current era, making those sites 8,000 years old. They're not human remains, but they're um, um, a bunch of um, hunting and butchering points and, and artifacts. Really interesting, really cool. And when I discovered this about six, seven years ago, the Forest Service wouldn't tell me where it was, and I took my American Indian history class out there on a field trip, and we combed the land <laughs> like a search and rescue team. And for that, I was named Summit, County Fac Summit Campus Faculty of the Year doing illegal things. <laughs> it's awesome. 
There's um, from the National Park Service website, Porcupine Peak site, the National Registrar of Historic Places. Wow, who knew? All right, the, the interesting part of that, I think, to bring it locally is that I think that that Porcupine Peak site is really close to these mountains here. Does anyone know where that is? That's the Grand Traverse and what's now known as the Gore Ranger, the Shining Mountains. So check that out. So it, I'm, I make this correlation because I, th I don't think that people were at Porcupine Peak without also venturing into the Gore Range 8,000 years ago or into the Shining Mountains. And I'm sure they had their name for that place. So indigenous people have been, by this calculation, using the Shining Mountains and, and enjoying and living within the Shining Mountains for up to 8,000 years at least. And that's just from the one site, two sites that we found. All right, moving on. Um, we get into this era, 1 to 1300. Um, most of us know this era for the spectacular Pueblo ruins um, down in southwestern Colorado here. Of course, Cliff Palace for Mesa Verde. Many of us have probably visited this place. And here we have um, Hoven Weep. Um, and then Chimney Rock. And then moving on into the 1700s, um, we, ha we, get, we start to get a little bit of a shift here. Um, here we have um, the Utes basically taking from the Continental Divide west, and they've pretty much mastered that mountain terrain at this point. Um, but over here, we just kind of have this loose Plains Apache um, designation of the people who are living there. And there's a reason for this. Um, but first of all, the Utes just weren't, weren't just the Utes. Um, they were uh, m many families of many lineages, and, and, and they had you know, up to 11 different designations for their very um, specific um, ethnicities in, in which they, uh, to, to which they claimed living all over Colorado and Utah and even into Wyoming there and down into New Mexico. Um, but in 1800, and it was probably a little before this, if I had to guess, or from what I know, that we see a change over here. And so it's just not just this big Plains Apache. The reason that it was Plains Apache before is because there was, I think there was a very sparse population of folks living out there on um, the Great Plains. It's an extremely hard place to live. The, if you've driven across the Great Plains, do you see any huge rivers besides maybe the Arkansas or the North Platte? There's not a lot of water out there, right? There's just a lot of grass, a lot of rolling um, plains. And th these people didn't, th the people would live on those, those few rivul rivulets of the river drainages, but for them to live in large populations, they, they really couldn't exist. There just weren't enough riparian zones, the, the, the areas that are near the rivers, that, that people can find wood and water and, and animals and resources to live on. However, something changed. Does anyone know what I'm about to say? <laughs> Not quite yet. <laughs> um, well, during this period, we have, I have the names of these people. Because it's important to keep their names alive, and not just not just pictures of, of random people. But this is during this time period. Shawana, he's a Ute, 1863, went to Washington actually. This is a Cheyenne woman, and these paintings are all from George Catlin. Her name is Tissawana, not Cheyenne, 1832. She who bathes her knees. Translation. This is another. These are all George. Catlin renditions. Um, it was an artist, obviously, in the 1830s and 40s, went around and captured some great images. This is, uh, he just called this Comanche warrior with teepees. And teepees are new. 
1835. They're, they're kind of new. Um, and he called this one an Arapaho family. And he called this one a Kiowa brother and sister. Okay, here's what happened. So those Plains Apaches were out there. And in 1680, a, a thing happened in the Santa Fe area with all these Pueblos down in the southwest. And a guy named Pope led the Pueblo and people who had been oppressed by the Spanish <coughs> Excuse me. ever since about 1540. The Spanish had been oppressing these people. They basically made them slaves. They took over and just made them work for them down in this area. They took everything they had and they kept them living in destitute poverty. Well, Pope and the Pueblos were sick of it. In 1680, they revolted. It's called Pope's Rebellion or, or the Pueblo Revolt. And not only did they kill a bunch of the Spanish and get them out of there for only 12 years, but they did get them out for 12 years. Um, they got all their horses and they released a bunch of the horses that these people had and they also took a bunch of them and, and they, didn't, they didn't really love the horses down there. I mean, they, they used a few of them, but you know who could really benefit from this? Yeah. A place where there's a lot of sun, unlimited energy, and a lot of grass. So there's, at this time, millions and millions and millions of buffalo living out here, but, but no one can really catch them because the buffalo just roam around in these big herds and they're faster and they're, they're more adept at moving across the land than humans are, and they live on this grass. And then the sun, continues to shine and continues to grow grass and the buffaloes continue to eat grass and the, the buffalo herds continue to proliferate. What's another, what's another piece of technology, another animal that could do that? Yeah, the horse. So 1680, I'm thinking by 1740 or 50 or 60, this is happening. You know, one of these traditional images of, of Native Americans in Colorado. And this, this has just happened on the Great Plains. It's just one place. But um, when, I teach, when I teach this lesson on a certain night in one of my classes, I get so jazzed because I think this is one of the most, I think this is one of the greatest moments in American history. I don't, there aren't very many times in history that I've ever seen in, in all the 25 years I've been studying it that there was a transformation this big. Poor people who were living up on the peripheries of great civilizations, the Mandans and the Illinois and the, and the Iowan people, the poor people, they were called the Cheyenne and the Comanche and the, and the Pawnee and the Arapaho and the Kiowa. They saw, they saw this horse and they went, if we take that thing and go out there to where there's unlimited grass, where we don't have to feed it anything. We don't have to do anything to keep it alive. It can move us vast distances, and not only will it do that, so that we can chase these things, we chase these things and we kill them, and it makes for our entire life. My friend Leon calls the buffalo Walmart. <laughs> Provides everything. Get everything you want out of the buffalo. Your food, your clothing, your furniture, your house, it becomes everything. And, and this initiated one of the, the, the greatest, one of the most powerful cultures that's ever existed. The Plains people. And there they are, a, a Cheyenne um, family. And like I said earlier, the teepees didn't even exist till then. They didn't have buffalo hides. I mean, they may have had some elk hides and stuff, but they would live in... Um, more wigwams and, and travel from place to, and kind of leave them and then, you know, seasonally move and flush the squirrels or whatever were living there and make it their home again and then, and then go to the next one. But now they could just carry it around. They could just, you know, put it on the sled, put it on the skids and, and carry those thousand pound things. Well, something happened, of course. Um, 
What happened right around here? Yeah. So this changed everything. Um, and this is where this story kind of goes downhill, really. Um, gold was discovered um, by the, the Russell family, some Georgians, in uh, uh, Dry Creek, a tributary Cherry Creek in 1858, down there, Denver. And in 1859, um, the gold rush happened. And uh, I want to read you a quote from The Contested Plains, my favorite book, by Elliot West. And the gold rushers here, this is the first year of the gold rush, the first big year of the gold rush, 1859. Here's what, here's what, a, uh, here's what one of the travelers, one of the gold rushers wrote. And my contacts don't work. Last night, Rogers cut down a lone cottonwood tree, high up in the branches of which was tied a dead Indian. On my protesting that such sacrilege would bring down the whole Sioux nation upon us, he replied that he was going to have a fire if he had to fight every Indian on the South Platte. As the tree struck the ground, bones, blankets, red ochre, and trinkets flew in all directions. And that became the prevailing attitude. And the people were moved. And the genocide ensued in our state. This is a rendition of the Sand Creek site where the Sand Creek Massacre took place. And this is just a big one where, uh, where uh, uh, Colonel Shivington um, came with the 3rd Colorado Cavalry and surrounded a peaceful village of Cheyenne Arapaho people and gunned them down all day long. As they laid in the creek, freezing, they went around and shot everyone that they could and then they mutilated them and took parts of their bodies back to Denver on atop their flags. And this is the, the, we went from one of the greatest periods of Colorado history and one of the most powerful and inspiring and inspirational periods to one of the saddest periods in, of any history anywhere here in Colorado. So I'm going to close today with um, just another quote from uh, Elliot West, and he's a, he's a spectacular author. Um, I'm going to see if I can hit the slides as I read. He finishes the Contested Plains with this. It's hard not to wonder how different those years might have been if all sides had used their prodigious imaginations to picture how varied peoples and dreams might occupy the same place. In their purest forms, the visions could not coexist, and it may be that no common ground was possible. We shouldn't waste time wishing frogs had wings. But after all, Indians and whites were masters of change. Their performances were so impressive precisely because they could envision other ways and then muster the will to make them happen. Perhaps their failures should push us to reperceive our own neighborhoods, our modern versions of town sites, stream valleys, and cottonwood groves into more tolerant shapes we might find guiding stories that allow a fuller human dignity. <laughs> and I think that's what we can take away from, um, uh, from this history. You know, um, histories can be pretty rough uh, a lot of the time, as I found. And um, I found that if I uh, facilitate a history with my students that's, that's just a downer, they just walk out and they go, why even live? Why even look at this? Why even study? The, the, the purpose of history is to, is to look at the stories and look at the ways that people have behaved meritoriously in the past, how, how people have behaved in good ways 
and to try to emulate that in your own life. And then to look at how people have misbehaved and how, how cultures and societies and people have suffered and misery has ensued and to um, issue those parts and, and remove those from your own life and, and go forth and allow for a fuller human dignity. And that's where I leave it because the, uh, I believe our friends from the re reservation are going to um, speak more to the present day, but that's as it exists today. Does anyone have questions? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.